to turn to the book of Revelation and chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, page 2044, the letters to the churches. Revelation and chapter 2. <coughs> Does God speak to the church? Yes. yes, indeed he does. If you want to know the way that he would speak to a church, read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. So there's seven very good examples of the way that he speaks to a church. And here is the letter to the church in Ephesus. So Revelation 2 Reading from verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, that you cannot endure evil men, you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they're not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. <clears throat> I want us to look at four things this morning. The first thing will be a little bit of background on the church of Ephesus. And then we're going to look at this letter to the church, who it is, who is addressing the church, and how he refers to himself. The commendations of the master to his people. God does commend us. You can get a good pat on the back. And also the rebuke and call to repentance. So first let's just look a little bit at the background <coughs> of the church in Ephesus. If you'd like to turn to the book of Acts and chapter 18, page 1799, Acts and chapter 18. <coughs> Going to read from verse 24, Acts 18. <clears throat> now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God <coughs> more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, 
the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, <coughs> demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. And it came about <coughs> that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found some disciples and said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No. We've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. <coughs> and he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were, in all, about twelve men. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he withdrew from them, took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And Paul was performing extraordinary miracles by the hand, God was performing <clears throat> extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Ephesus was a very wicked cosmopolitan place of idolatry. It was well known for the worship of Artemis or Diana. It, it was steeped in all kinds of occultic activities and immorality. It was not a nice place to be. But God did an amazing work. And he started it with a man called Apollos. And we hear about this man. He's referred to as, well, I think the New American Standard <coughs> says eloquent. I think, I don't know if King James says, um, I don't know what King James says, actually. I should have looked it up. But, but the word actually, eloquent, does it? Right, okay. The word is logios, is, is a logios man, is a, is a man of the word. It's only used in this one place of this one man. It's a rare thing, dear friends. We're told in the scriptures that the Jews, the Jewish people, were entrusted with the oracles, the logios of God. And Apollos was a logion. A, sorry, he was a logios. The oracles are a logion. It's, it's from the word we get logos, the word. So this man, who was never born again, who'd only known the preaching of John the Baptist, who'd only been baptized with a baptism of repentance, but was not born of the Holy Spirit, was on fire to proclaim and make known a coming Messiah to anybody who would listen to him. And he was mighty in the scriptures. Wouldn't you just have loved to have heard this man preach? Straight out, of the Old Testament, 
not heard about Jesus, not heard about Calvary, not heard about the resurrection. But he was on fire because he knew that the word of God was true. Dear friends, that's rare. That's rare. You couldn't shut this man up. He wasn't bothered who didn't agree with him. He knew the scripture was true. That John the Baptist was the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. To make his path straight. And that the Messiah was going to come. And he didn't even have the Holy Spirit in him to help And then this dear couple come and explain to him more fully what's happened. And he goes from being on fire to exploding. <laughs> That's it. He wants to tell the whole of the Roman Empire. He wants to get off across Europe. And off he goes. They can't stop him. And he leaves behind... Twelve men who've heard him, he's made them as disciples, but just like him, they're not born again. They've received a baptism of repentance, and along comes Paul to this place called Ephesus, and he tells them about the Lord Jesus and the work of Calvary, and then he lays his hands upon them. They're baptized in the name of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And that is the beginning of the church in Ephesus. Two men. Who believe that they are entrusted. With the true word of God. It's rare dear friends. A man called Apollos, who knew that as a Jew, he was entrusted with the oracles of God. He was to be a light to the Gentiles even. And to make God known. And he did. A man called Saul, who once he got saved, was so indebted. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel. Because he knew it was the power of God unto salvation, and he was entrusted with it. Dear friends, being entrusted with the word of God should change our lives. Being entrusted with the gospel. <clears throat> seeing the magnitude of knowing the truth, and having God entrusted to you to share with other people should change your life and make you radically different. It did for Apollos and it did for the Apostle Paul and they were the two men who were right at the foundation of this work in Ephesus. Paul stayed there two years. He did three months in the synagogue until they got hardened. Dear friends, there comes a point where you share the word of God with people for so long. Yeah. And they listen and then they start to mock. You can go so far. But then there's a mocking spirit and you've just got to leave it. Doesn't mean that God can't change that somewhere along the line. But that's where he got to. They became hardened. Mm. They became hardened and so he went to the Gentiles as well. And preach to the Gentiles also. Use this place, this <coughs> um, this learning place of Tyrannus. And he stayed two years. And God did amazing things. Paul preached the word, and God stretched forth his hand to do mighty miracles in the name of Jesus. That sound familiar? That's all we need to do, dear friends. We need to get on fire 
knowing that we're entrusted with the word of God, the very oracles of God, mighty in the scriptures, and make Jesus known. And God will stretch forth his hand and do great and mighty works. He's promised to do it. Well, <clears throat> there were these fellas, sons of Sceva. They'd seen demons being cast out in the name of Jesus, and they thought, right, we'll have a go at that. And so they go to cast the demon out of a man in the name of Jesus. They say, in the name of Jesus, who, who Paul preaches, <laughs> out you go. Well, the man turns on them. He says, uh, Paul, I know. <laughs> Jesus, I certainly know. But who are you? <laughs> and he rips them to shreds. <clears throat> well, that causes quite a stir. Revival breaks out. And they're, they're coming and dumping all their out I mean... There's a real revival in this place. It causes a real stir. That's Ephesus. Steeped in idolatry, steeped in the occult, steeped in immorality, but the power of the Word of God. And that's this church. And Paul writes to this church what we call the book of Ephesians and tells them, he instructs them about wrestling against principalities and powers, and boy, did they have a good principality in that place. Because there was this goddess, this shrine to um, Diana, Artemis. And, and there were some powerful demonic forces behind that thing, along with everything else that was going on in that place. But God did an amazing work. And he <clears throat> urges them to stand, and having done all, to stand. And we were looking at that over the last couple of weeks. And then we come to the final letter to the church in Ephesus. This is some 20, 30 years later. It's direct from the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's how the church started out. That's its background. How long does it take for a church to go wrong? <clears throat> and where does it go wrong? Where does it start? That's what I want us to think a little bit about this morning. So number one, how does Jesus introduce himself to this church? Well, he says he's the one who holds the seven stars. If you look at the previous verses, we read that the seven stars are the, the angels of the churches. You know that churches have angels? I hope you do. If you didn't, you do now. You do now. The Lord says so. I'm quite sure the enemy appoints uh, his forces as well against churches. He has um, all kinds of uh, satanic activity to destroy the church, but each church, according to this, has an angel. And they are all under the command of who? Jesus. Jesus is the one who holds the stars. He's the one behind the angels. He's the one behind all the angelic realm that are watching over you and I and this church and every other church that truly belongs to Jesus Christ. That's who he is. And he's walking among them. He's watching. And he's instructing. He's keeping an eye on things. He knows everything that's going on. <clears throat> so, 
What does he say to this church? First thing, commendations. What's he pleased about? What, what does he know about these people? What does he know about you? He starts off by saying he knows their works. He knows what they're doing. He knows their works. He knows their labor. Do you know that Jesus knows everything that you do for God? Everything. I hope you know that. Well, we can know it, can't we? Intellectually. But are you really aware of it? You know, the, the, the Lord Jesus knows everything that you've ever done for him. And why? He knows exactly what it's cost you to do it. He knows whether you did your best, whether you give it your best shot, whether you were trusting him, whether you were going for it in your own strength. He knows everything that you have ever done in service for God. He knows it all. I don't know how much there is, but he knows it all. And he commends them. He says, I know your works. I know your labor. I know you've been grafting. I know it's been tough. I know your perseverance as well. I know you've had to grit your teeth. <laughs> and keep going sometimes. I know it's not been easy. The Lord knows it all. He knows what they've done. <clears throat> Turn to the book of Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Page 1899, verse 9 says, Let us not grow loose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. Keep going. Keep going. If you're doing what the Lord has told you to do, keep going. Don't give up. Don't lose heart in doing what's right. Keep going. You'll reap in due season. The Lord's watching everything. He sees it all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Page 1869, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. God knows about it all. He's watching. He walks among the lampstands. He's watching over the church. He sees everything that's going on. He knows everything that God's people are doing for him. Nothing escapes his notice. Amen? I hope that's an encouragement this morning. And he knows why you're doing it. He knows how much it costs you. He knows how tired you are. He knows everything about it. He knows how the enemy is trying to destroy you. The Lord knows everything. I know your works. I know your perseverance. I know your patience. I know your endurance. I know. God knows. What else does he know? What else does he commend them for? He commends them for being discerning. For testing things. 
Why should we test things? Why should we question what people are doing in the name of Jesus? Sounds most uncharitable. Why should we do it? Because we're commanded to do it, dear friends. That's why. Because the scripture tells us to do it. This church is testing people's ministries and rejecting those who are false. Testing and rejecting those who are false. And Jesus says, Oh, you've been very judgmental, you Lord. No, he doesn't. He says, He is pleased with that. I know that you have tested the apostles, found them to be false. Well done. What about the churches that don't test anything? Mm -hmm. Just welcome everything on board. Because it's in the name of Jesus. And because somebody's claiming to be a, a lovely brother in Christ. Or even worse, a lovely sister in Christ. What about that? Does God commend that? No, dear friends, he doesn't. And yet that's the vast majority of the church today. Isn't it? Yes. Jesus commends this church for testing things and rejecting what is false. And he says, well done. Let's look at one or two scriptures. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Page 1885. <clears throat> so you're always on about this kind of stuff. Well, because, dear friends, it's important. It is pleasing to the head of the church, Jesus Christ. He commends this church for doing it. And he knows. 2 Corinthians 11, reading from verse 2, Paul says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. So God gets jealous? He certainly does. I betrothed you to one husband that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. <coughs> but I'm afraid... Lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom you have not preached, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, you can receive a different spirit. Really? Yes, you can. You can receive the spirit of Antichrist. That's a different spirit. Which you've not received, or a different gospel. You say there's a different gospel? Yes, there's lots of different gospels. Which you've not accepted, you bear it beautifully. Verse 13. Such men are false apostles. Deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. What are they? False apostles. The church is full of false apostles, false teachers, false prophets, and all the more as we approach the return of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. And so Jesus is commending this church because they've put people to the test and found them to be false. And what do you think they said? These people are false, that's what they said. 
Oh, well, you don't name them. Oh, yes, you do. How does anybody know who you're talking about unless you name them? And Jesus commands the church. What else does he command the church for? <clears throat> they hate the Nicolaitans. They hate the Nicolaitans. He says, well done, because you hate what I hate. Ooh, you hate as you. This is hate speech, isn't it? Fancy hating anything. Jesus says we should hate what he hates. The fear of the Lord is to hate iniquity and evil doing. We should hate what he hates. And when we hate what he hates, he commends us. Oh, we shouldn't hate anything. Really? Well, this church hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus said, well done. Well done. Because I hate the deals, deeds of the Nicolaitans. <clears throat> what on earth are the deeds of the Nicolaitans then? <clears throat> because they're mentioned more than once. <clears throat> The word, the Greek word, comes from Nike. If you've got any of those shoes on. <laughs> well, it is actually where it comes from. They've taken that. And it means victory or ruling. So you've got a pair of them shoes on. You've got to win. <clears throat> That's probably why they chose the name. Yeah? It means victory or ruling, and then the laitans, the laity, are the people. The people. Uh, <coughs> so the, the people ruling, or ruling the people. It can be either. How does that get in the church? Hmm? A multitude of ways, dear friends. A multitude of ways. You mean to say that churches can end up being ruled by people? Oh yes. Well, is there anything wrong with that? Oh yes. Jesus hates it. <clears throat> and says that we should hate it. Two, churches being overtaken and ruled and governed by people. Well, good have structures, you know. Mm -hmm. Haven't heard that one. Let's have a committee. <laughs> we, we should have votes on these things, shouldn't we? Really? Who says? <coughs> Show me the scriptures for that. Because the Bible's saying churches should not be ruled by people. And people should not be ruled over by other people in the church. And God hates it. God hates it. Let's look at one or two scriptures, because you're all looking a bit worried at this point. <clears throat> Turn to Matthew chapter 20. Men ruling. When the church gets taken over by people. Whose church is it? Who's the one who should be head? <coughs> Sorry, Her Majesty, but I'm not anti-royal. 
in any shape or form. But there is one head of the church in the book of Ephesians. <laughs> we are told that he is given as head over all things to the church, which is his body. He is far above all principality and power. He's been given the name which is above every name. And he's got the angels in his hand. He walks among the lampstands, he's watching everything that's going on, and he says people should not be ruling his church. So why do we do it? Matthew chapter 20 then. Let's read from verse 20. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons bowing down and making requests of him. Well, there you go, you've just got to come to him and he'll give you anything you ask. Okay? Find the scripture for that, can you? I mean, she's even bowing before him. It's going to be good. He said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, Command, in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and one on your left. Jesus answered and said, you just don't know what you're asking for. You know, sometimes we can go to the Lord, we, we just don't understand what we're asking for. I'm sorry, sorry if I've shocked anybody with that statement, but... <clears throat> You just don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said to him, well, yeah, we're able. <clears throat> he said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and on my left, this is not mine to give. It's for those to whom it has been prepared by my father. Mm. And here in this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. That's the way the world works, isn't it? You've got to have a structure, you've got to have a hierarchy, you've got to make it work, it's got to come down from the top, you've got to have a few good levels. Everybody's got to have a job and a position and a title. That's what we need, isn't it? That's the way the Gentiles do it. It is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you should be the servant of all. Dear friends, there is something which has overtaken the world, the church across Africa, across the Western world, everywhere. It's everywhere. Men ruling in the church. <clears throat> and I know somebody who hates it. Do you? Well, you should do. Because we've just read it. And you should know somebody else who hates it, because it should be you. You should hate it. We should never hear of a church being run by people, 
governed by people, and the Lord just shut out of the whole thing without absolutely hating it, without it making our blood boil, and without us piping up and saying something about it. Because it's just plain wrong. And men ruling over others in the church, it's wrong, dear friends. And Jesus hates it. He says so. Matthew chapter 23. And this church in Ephesus has got it right. They've been well instructed by Paul, haven't they? Mm -hmm. They got it right. <clears throat> they have the letter to the Ephesians, which is a lot about the church, isn't it? Being the body of Christ and everything, about authority, about the headship of Christ, <clears throat> submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. They had all that, and they got it right. And they were rejecting the whole idea of people ruling in the church. Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 1. Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chairs of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things, and they do not do them. <clears throat> they tie up heavy loads, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. They broaden their phylacteries, lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the places of honour of banquets. The chief seats in the synagogues, respectful greetings in the marketplaces, being called by men, rabbi, teacher, do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, who? Christ. What shouldn't we have? Why not? We've got one leader. How many do we need? One. One leader. Which is Christ. Call no man father. Well, 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 what about Father O'Hara? <laughs> and Father Maloney? Could be out of a job. God hates it. God hates it. Turn to Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> Paul's passing through, he's passing by, he doesn't want to go specifically to Ephesus. So he goes down the road to a place called <clears throat> Miletus. And he sends to Ephesus for the, the presbytery. Verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. What are they? Elders. The presbytery. Presbyterus. The Greek word presbyterus. Elders. The elders. He calls the elders, and he starts to address them. He's telling them that he's served with humility and tears. 
But let's, for the sake of time, we'll go down to verse 27. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel, the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It's called the presbytery and he's saying that they are overseers. Episcopos. And what should they be doing? To shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. <clears throat> this church has been bought by God's own blood. It belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the one leader. They're all sheep, you've got to shepherd them. You've got to watch over them. Because they're not yours, they're his. So watch out. I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in among them, not sparing the flock, from your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There'll be people in the church who want a nice little following after themselves. And the elders, the overseers in the church should always be watching for that. Because the sheep belong to Jesus Christ. And you know what shepherds should do with wolves? Beat the living daylights out of them. <laughs> David was a shepherd after God's own heart. And when he saw a lion or a bear coming after the lambs, he'd go and he'd grab it by the beard and he'd beat the living daylights out of it. And dear friends, I'm not advocating violence, <laughs> though I'm very tempted, because there are so many wolves, false apostles, False prophets, false leaders, false everything. And what are they after? They're after a position, they're after a title, they're after the adoration of God's people. And God says he does not give his glory to anybody else. And that, dear friends, is Nicolaitanism. And Jesus hates it. And he commends this church because they hate it too. And where did they get that from? Well, they went down to Miletus and they heard it from the Apostle Paul himself. It was his last warning to them. Watch out for this. Shepherd, the flock of God, watch out for these wolves. These people who want to come in and rule over God's people, watch out for them when they're wanting to draw out disciples after themselves and make a name for themselves. One is your teacher. One is your leader. Christ is the head of the church. What else? <clears throat> One last thing. I've never run out of time. There's a rebuke to this church. He's commended them. They're toiling away, they're striving away, they've got perseverance, they've got discernment, they're testing things, they hate the whole idea of somebody coming in, lording it over God's people, they don't like celebrities, 
They don't like charlatans. They've got a lot going for them, this church, haven't they? We could do with a few churches on this model, couldn't we? Well, they've had two years of the Apostle Paul, haven't they? Laying a foundation for this church. But what's gone wrong? Jesus says, I've got this against you. I've got this against you. <clears throat> against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Hmm? Well, Jesus can be. Jesus can be against you. Why, why would Jesus be against us? Well, he tells us. We've lost. They've lost the first love. They've lost the first love. They've got all this right, but they've lost that love. We put God first. came to Jesus one day, they said, Teacher, what's the foremost commandment? What's the most important one? Hmm? Don't matter. Well, what's the most important commandment? What's the foremost commandment, Lord? And what did he answer? The foremost commandment is this here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And dear friends, we can have our discernment ministries all right. We, we can have our church structures all right. We can be toiling away for the Lord. But do we love him? Because the Father seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. God wants you to love Him. Otherwise, you, you can prophesy, you, you can speak in tongues, you can do miracles, and it'll all be like an empty gong without love. Without love. For the Lord, it'll be like a noisy God. Dear friends, do we love Him? Do we love the Lord? Because this church has got so much right. And the Lord has to say, but I've got this against you. You've lost it. You've forgotten that the most important thing is that you love me. Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Oh, 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 I think I've got my doctrine. No, no I didn't. Have. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Feed my lambs. Go and care for other people. If you love me, do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? Because you can have everything else right. You can have everything else going. But do you love the Lord? When you get up on a morning, is the first one on your mind the Lord? Is the first praise on your lips to Jesus? Do you love the Lord first and foremost above everything else? <clears throat> Is he the reason that you're doing what you're doing? Because you love him. You love him because he first loved you. How do we know? <clears throat> and what can take that away? I just want to look at a couple of scriptures before we close. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter three, page nineteen sixty one. 
Jesus warned, in the last days most people's love will go cold. Because lawlessness increases. Difficult days come. It's going to get wild, dear friends. Persecution. Everything against us. And Jesus says most people's love's just going to go. And he's going to hold that against us. He is. He is. More than that, Jesus said, if you don't repent, he'll remove the lampstand. What do you mean, remove the lampstand? There'll be no light. There'll be no sense of the presence of God. Dear friends, there are churches all over the place. The building is called a church. The people call themselves a church. But the Lord has removed the lampstand. It's dead. It might still have a reputation. It might still have a name. It might still hold to a doctrine which sounds good. But the Lord's removed the lampstand. In the days of Malachi, the people were still coming to the temple. They were still making their offerings. And God had to say, I wish someone had shut the door. So these people wouldn't needlessly offer things on the altar. I'm not taking any notice of it. Somebody, for goodness sake, shut the place down. So isn't it awful these churches being made into carpet warehouses? Shut the things down! If there's no love of God, shut the thing down! If the lamp stands being removed, what is it? It's a group of people, dear friends. Lord's not there. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 3 realize this in the last days. Difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. How much, dear friends, do you like your pleasure? Because it's directly related to how much you love God. What else is directly related to how much you love God? How much you love money? Jesus said you cannot serve God and money. You can't serve God and wealth. You can't live for the things of this world and for God. You will love the one and despise the other. You will hold to one and hate the other. It's like a seesaw. One side goes up, the other side has to go down. And the more we love the things of this world, dear friends, friendship with the world is enmity with God. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. The more we love ourselves, the more we love our pleasures, the more we love our possessions, the more... We love, what was the other one, where, where did we get to? <laughs> but you've got the idea, the less we love God. And dear friends, Jesus is saying, you've left your first love of God. And what have you left it for? One of these other things. 
And what do you need to do? Repent. Turn. Change the way you think. Change the way you live. From the moment you get up in the morning to the moment that you go to bed at night, you need to be a lover and a worshipper of the God who came and died for you on Calvary's cross. Amen? It's an amazing letter to what was an amazing church. Started by two amazing men. But it was so close to closing. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. And Lord, you, you, you just say it as it is. Lord, maybe I don't, but you do. And Lord, we see the way you spoke to that church. You, you've got so much to commend them for. So much that they were getting right. And they missed the most important thing. To just love you. For who you are. Because you first loved us. Delivered yourself up for us. Lord, you deserve our best. You deserve our adoration. You deserve our all. Lord, help us, help us to see things right in these days. Help us to give you our best. Help us to be worshippers, because that's what you want. Help us to hate the things that you hate, Lord. Help us to see your church the way that you see it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.